بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الانبياء وعلى اله الاسكياء واصحابه الاتقياء اما بعد Today inshallah we are starting with hadith number 35 عن ابي هريره رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا تحاسدوا ولا تناجسوا ولا تناجشوا ولا تباغضوا ولا تدابروا ولا يبع بعضكم على بيع بعض وكونوا عباد الله اخوانا المسلم اخو المسلم لا يظلمه ولا يخذله ولا يكذبه ولا يحقره التقوى ها هنا ويشير الى صدره ثلاث مرات بحسب امرئ من الشر ان يحقر اخاه المسلم كل المسلم على المسلم حرام دمه وماله وعرضه رواه مسلم The hadith is narrated by Abu Hurairah radiyallahu anhu The messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Do not be jealous of one another and do not inflate prices for one another and do not hate one another and do not turn away from one another and do not undercut one another in trade but rather be slaves of Allah and brothers a muslim is the brother of a muslim he does not oppress him nor does he fail him nor does he lie to him nor does he hold him in contempt taqwa is right here as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam pointed to his chest three times it is evil enough for a man to hold his brother muslim in contempt the whole muslim the whole of a muslim is in in is um haram is prohibited for another muslim his blood his property and his honor the hadith is narrated by imam muslim rahmatullahi alayhi so in this hadith as you have heard just through the translation it's full of so many messages and so many lessons it's a very powerful hadith few in words but this one hadith in itself if implemented our lives would change our communities would change and we'll examine this in today's class the first thing the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam starts off with and you'll notice one thing in this hadith and also the next hadith in these two hadith imam nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi is focusing on different elements of brotherhood how to establish proper brotherhood because establishing proper brotherhood is the necessary ingredient for a successful society if people can't be brothers with one another if they can't get along if we can't have sisterhood societies internally will collapse the foundation itself will fall apart so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam teaches us these very important and invaluable lessons the first thing he says la tahasadu do not be jealous do not be envious of one another the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam starts off by telling us the one thing to stay away from which in reality was actually the first sin ever committed the one thing that really pushed shaitan off from being a worshiper from being an obedient servant of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he saw the creation of adam alayhi salam and jealousy fell in his heart how can someone who came after me be better than me and many of us get caught with this someone comes after us someone maybe younger than us someone who hasn't been in the community as long as we have someone who hasn't studied as long as we have and all of a sudden they're gone ahead of us and jealousy starts so here he starts off the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam reminding us of the very first sin and also a point for us to reflect over how that ended how that ended shaitan became ar rajim how that ended as an element of his jealousy he then tempted adam alayhi salam which took him out of jannah and brought him down to this earth jealousy never ends well so imam jurjani alama jurjani rahmatullahi alayhi in his at ta'rifat while defining the word hasad he says it is to desire the decline or the loss of the blessing for the one that you are jealous of so if a person is jealous of another person jealousy in its meaning is for you to desire that that person loses that bounty that favor is gone away from them that blessing of allah leaves them 
You see someone who has a nice car, and in your heart you think, I wish that person loses their car. You go to a wedding, you see someone getting married, they look very happy on the stage, and here you are, still single, you think to yourself, I hope their marriage falls apart. You don't want to see someone else being happy. Someone's engaged, it bothers you that one of your friends got engaged before you did. And in your heart you start thinking, you can't tell anyone, because that's the nature of jealousy. You know that if anyone knew of what you carry in your heart, you would lose all respect in anyone that ever respected you. So jealousy is a dirty little secret that you keep in your heart. And you think to yourself, my friend got engaged before I did, they got a job before I did, they graduated before I did, you know, they got into college before I did, so I hope that they lose what they have. This is the definition of hasad. Alamma Mawardi rahmatullahi alayhi, while talking about hasad, he says that know that indeed jealousy, hasad, is a very disgusting and blameworthy characteristic. Not only does it harm your religion, but it also harms your body as well. It also hurts you as a person. Physically it hurts you. It'll mentally distract you. It'll play a toll on you. He says, it is enough to know that it is so harmful, jealousy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an tells us to seek protection. وَمِن شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدٍ I seek protection from the one who embodies jealousy, who, who is a jealous person when he, when he is jealous. The person who is jealous, in essence, has a problem with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the problem that he has with Allah is, he is displeased that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave someone more than what Allah gave him. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave someone something different from what Allah gave them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, نَحْنُ قَسَمْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ مَعِيشَتَهُمْ That we are the ones who distribute. And it's not your choice that who becomes what, who becomes uh, a physicist, and who becomes a physician, and who becomes uh, an architect, and who becomes you know, a biologist. This, this is all in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives peace in your life. You ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you contentment with what you have in your life. Now there are different types of people when it comes to jealousy. There are those people, مِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَسْعَى فِي نَقْلِ ذَلِكَ إِلَى نَفْسِي There are some people who will see a bounty and they will want that bounty. Okay, so they will want the person to lose it and in return they would like to gain control of it. I, I wish that that person gets divorced and loses their beautiful spouse, their obedient, kind, loving spouse, so that I can go and marry that person. This is, an, this is a type of hasad. The, another type of hasad is, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَسْعَى فِي إِزَالَتِهِ عَنِ الْمَحْسُودِ فَقَطْ مِنْ غَيْرِ نَقْلٍ إِلَى نَفْسِهِ The second person is someone who wants the mahsud. Mahsud means the one who you are jealous of. The one who they are jealous of, they want them to lose that bounty, but they don't want it for themselves. They just don't want you to be happy. So the scholars, they say, both of these are bad, but the second one is very bad. For the first one, you can say there's an element of greed there, and the human being became weak to greed. So that's why they wanted what they saw in another person. The second one is just outright evil. You don't want it for yourself, it bothers you that another person has it. So this is self, the scholars just say this is the worst of the two. Ibn Umar radiallahu anh, there is a narration narrated to him, a weak narration, that anna Iblis qala li Nuh, that Iblis said to Nuh alayhi salam, ithnatani bihima uhlika, Bani Adam, that there are two things that cause the destruction of the children of Adam alayhi salam. Al-Hasad, wa bil-Hasad ilu'intu wa ju'iltu shaytanan rajima. The first of the two is jealousy. And then he said, it is because of jealousy that I was cursed and I was expelled. Wal-Hirs, and the second is greed. Ubiha Adamu al-Jannatu kullaha. Adam salam was given access to everything in Jannah except for one tree. And shaitan fed an element of greed into the heart of Hawa and Adam. And then they went after the one thing that they were told not to go after. And as a result of that, they were sent down to the world. Kharajahu ibn Abi Dunya, ibn Abi Dunya narrates this particular narration. Now there are another type of people that they experience jealousy, but they don't act upon it. They fight it. 
in their heart they feel bad that another person is more successful, another person has more. They don't act upon it, they fight it off. They keep telling themselves, I have to be content with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me. I should be happy with another person. In their heart, they keep thinking that let me go put a few nails in that person's Maserati. It'll be so easy, no one will see me. But they fight it off, they say no, I won't be jealous and I won't hurt that person. For this person, Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala said, لا يأثم بذلك He will have no sin at all. Rather, he may actually be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for fighting off that desire. In one place, Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala said, Every human being experiences jealousy. From the scholars, to those who are illiterate when it comes to their deen. To the wealthy, all the way to the poor. You would think that a person, once they're wealthy, they won't be jealous anymore. Is that true or false? It's false. Wealthy people have jealousy in their heart. You would think that a person, once they have the knowledge of the deen, they won't be jealous anymore. Wrong again. Because ulama, their hearts are plagued with jealousy. So Hassan al-Basri says, every insan has an element, every human being has some jealousy in their heart. Now the question is, whether you will act upon what that jealousy provokes you to do, or whether you will withhold and hold yourself back, and you will ignore it. There will always be that classmate of yours that you're jealous of. There will always be that friend of yours that you're jealous of. That teammate of yours that you're jealous of. Sometimes your own sibling that you have jealousy in your heart. Like the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam. Now you have a responsibility to hold back. The next um, type of person is someone who experiences jealousy. But in this jealousy they don't have a desire that the other loses what they have, they just desire to have the same. So you see someone dressed very nicely, in your heart you're not thinking that, I hope this person's clothes get burnt. Rather, you're thinking that only if I had clothes like these. Now, this, technically speaking, in Arabic, is not hasab, it's called ghibta. Ghayn ba ta and ta marbuta. Right? Ghibta, that's what it's called. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, لا حسد إلا فثنتين That there is no jealousy. Jealousy is not permitted, but in two things. What are these two things? رَجُلٌ آتَاهُ اللَّهُ مَالًا فَهُوَ يُنْفِقُهُ آنَاءَ اللَّيْنِ وَآنَاءَ النَّهَارِ وَرَجُلٌ آتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْقُرْآنِ فَهُوَ يَقُومُ بِهِ آنَاءَ اللَّيْلِ وَآنَاءَ النَّهَارِ the first person that it is permissible to be jealous of is one that Allah has given wealth to and he spends it day and night. In your heart you should think, I wish that I could be like that person. And the second person is the one who Allah has given the Qur'an to and you think to yourself, only if I knew the Qur'an like this person does and if I can read the Qur'an day and night like this person does. Now even though in this hadith the word hasid is used, the scholars they say that هذا هو الغبط This is not hasid. Because hasid would entail that you desire that person forgets their Qur'an and you become hafid. That cannot be permitted in any way at all. Or you desire that that person loses their wealth and then you become wealthy and give charity. That's not permitted either. In this hadith, what's, what we're actually being told is ghibta. That you don't desire for that person to lose it, rather you desire to gain it so you can do equivalent to what they are doing. وَسَمَّاهُ حَسَدًا مِنْ بَابِ الْإِسْتِعَارَةِ However, the Prophet ﷺ used the word hasid, borrowing it to kind of connotate, to implement the meaning of being envious and having that element, not complete, but an element of jealousy. Now this type of jealousy, which, are, which we are calling ghibta, can be for two things. Either, in كَانَتِ الْفَضَائِلُ دُنْيَوِيَّةً فَلَا خَيْرَ فِي ذلك. Either you, are, you have ghibta, you have this halal jealousy, envy, for another person in terms of worldly issues that you think to yourself that I hope that this person maintains their mansion, but I get a mansion like they do. So he says that there is no good in this sort of ghibta. And it's actually something looked down upon. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in the Qur'an, قَالَ الَّذِينَ يُرِيدُونَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا يَا لَيْتَ لَنَا مِثْلَ مَا أُوْتِيَ قَارُونَ إِنَّهُ لَذُو حَظٍ عَظِيمٍ When Qarun, who was from the people of Musa alayhi salam, he did not accept Islam. He was related to Musa alayhi salam. He came out amongst the people displaying his wealth. And there were people who saw his wealth and they said, only if we had similar to what he has. They didn't desire for him to lose it. They just wanted what he had. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not state this ayah or state the statement of theirs in praise of them. Rather, it's actually 
showing how, how short-sighted they were. Because in the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the people of knowledge said, وَيْلَكُمْ ثَوَابُ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ لِمَنْ آمَنَ وَعَمِلَ الصَّالِحَةِ That forget what you're saying, having wealth in this world. Look for a reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you will find more benefit in that for those who believe and those who do good deeds. Then the second type is ghibta when it comes to dini umur, religious affairs. You see someone excelling in the deen, someone accomplishes something, and you think to yourself, I wish one day that I can accomplish that too. When we were in madrasa, memorizing the Qur'an, students would graduate from their tahfid al-Qur'an, they would memorize the Qur'an. And as friends and as fellow students, we would always participate in their graduations. And when we would sit there, Allah knows in our hearts, all of us that hadn't finished yet, what would we, what would we be thinking? Man, I can't wait till the day that I'm sitting there. I can't wait to become a hafid myself. And there were those students that would be in tears because they would be struggling. I recall once many of my classmates who we had joined together with, they actually all excelled and finished off before me. So I went to my teacher and I was sad. I wasn't sad that they finished off early, I was sad that I hadn't finished. So I went to my sheikh and I said to him, Sheikh, why is it taking me so long to memorize the Qur'an? So the sheikh said something very beautiful, Allah reward him. He gave me the energy that I needed to finish off. He said, some people, some servants of Allah are beloved to him. So Allah keeps them in the company of his Qur'an longer than others. And then he said, there will never be a day in your life after you become hafid that you will read this much Qur'an a single day. Months will pass by, years will pass by, you won't read as much as Qur'an as you do in one day here. It's a blessing of Allah. Ask Allah to lengthen this process. And it brought a new perspective to memorizing the Qur'an and it taking a little longer. And this is a, you know, a little motivation for those of us that are trying and struggling. Keep at it. Know that you being connected to the Qur'an in itself is the blessing. You know, that's the blessing, being connected to the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An example of ghibta, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Sahaba would be martyred in the battlefield and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would then make dua for shahada. He would see his brothers who attained shahada and then he himself would make dua for shahada. Umar radiallahu an saw his fellow companions attaining the high rank of shahada. He himself then made dua for Allahumma rzuqni shahadatan fi sabilik. He himself made dua for shahada. And there are uh, examples of this too. Then there's another type of person who experiences jealousy and this person, rather than being affected by the ills of jealousy and taking the harm and implementing it and trying to hurt another person, they go the opposite way. Rather than doing harm to that person, they recognize the disease, they acknowledge that they have a problem with themselves and they decide to counter it by doing good to that person. This is the highest of all of the people who experience jealousy. إِذَا وَجَدَ فِي نَفْسِهِ الْحَسَدِ سَعَى فِي إِزَالَتِهِ وَفِي الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَى الْمَحْسُودِ بِإِسْدَاءِ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَيْهِ وَالدُّعَاءِ لَهُ وَنَشْرِ فَضَائِلِهِ وَفِي إِزَالَةِ مَا وَجَدَ لَهُ فِي نَفْسِهِ مِنَ الْحَسَدِ That this person, he makes dua for him, he sends gifts to him, he tells people how great of a person that individual is, the one that you feel, jeal that you feel jealousy for, you tell others, that so-and-so person, Allah has given him wealth, but he's a very kind person. So-and-so person is wealthy, don't you know that he works with his hands and through halal means to earn his money? That's why he has so much barakah, that's why he's so happy. So-and-so person is getting married before I am, don't you know this person did khidmah of their parents and took the dua of their parents? You guys understand? So now they, they flip it, rather than speaking ill of that person, they speak in favor, they speak good of that person. حَتَّى يُبَدِّلَهُ بِمُحَبَّتِهِ Until the point comes that they praise that person, make dua for that person, you know, have good intentions towards that person, that that jealousy then turns into love. And as weird and twisted as that may sound, it happens. There are some people that you're jealous of, and you don't give in to the whispers of shaitan. You fight it out. You go against it. You go against it. You go against it. Until finally your heart opens up. And those walls that you've built out of insecurity, come down. And the person who was your enemy, كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيُّ hamim. That person then becomes a friend of yours. There are many ahadith and many verses of the Qur'an in dislike of jealousy. 
One hadith of Imam Abu Dawood rahmatullahi alayhi that he narrates from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu that I'd like to share. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Iyakum wal hasad. Be aware of jealousy. Stay away from jealousy. فَإِنَّ الْحَسَدَ يَأْكُلُ الْحَسَنَاتِ كَمَا تَأْكُلُ النَّارَ الْحَطَبُ أَوْ قَالَ عُشْبُ That stay away from jealousy. For indeed, jealousy eats away good deeds just like fire eats away dry wood, firewood or dry, ga- dry, dry grass. A little fire and some dry grass and you're going to have, it's going to eat it all away. Dry wood, it's going to eat it all away. That's what jealousy does to your good deeds. And unfortunately, jealousy exists in the hearts of the righteous too in our community. The people who read the Qur'an, the people who attend the masjid for salah, who attend the halaqat, who wear the hijab, who are practicing and observing of the deen. We've excelled in some places, but in our hearts we still harbor that jealousy. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify your hearts from jealousy and hypocrisy. Allahumma tahir qulubana min al-nifaq wal hasad. Oh Allah, purify our hearts from jealousy and hypocrisy. What are the causes of jealousy? Alama Mawardi rahmatullahi alayhi says, There are three causes of jealousy. Inna dawa'i al hasad, thalatha. There are three things that cause jealousy. The first thing he says is, Bughdul mahsud, to have enmity of the one that you are jealous of. You already have a problem with that person, you already had a disagreement with that person, you have a history with this person. And because you have a history, naturally jealousy will set in if they excel in life. So if you have a disagreement with someone and then you notice that this person is ahead of you, this person is doing better than you are, this is from amongst the dawa'i, the causes of jealousy. The second thing that he says is, you have failed to accomplish what another person has attained in life. Someone has attained something, you yourself have tried to attain it, but you constantly fail at it. You've been applying for a particular college. You've been trying and trying, but you failed repeatedly. Now some nobody comes and they apply and they get the job. Or some person who didn't try as hard as you did and they got the job. Someone who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, opened the path for on a particular thing. You know, they got the job. So naturally now jealousy comes in. How did that person pass the MCAT without putting in half the effort that I did? And again, always remember that I of the Qur'an نَحْنُ قَسَمْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ مَعِيشَتَهُمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who distributes. And just because you don't have what you wanted doesn't mean you lost out in life. Sometimes the hard truth is med school isn't for you. Sometimes the hard, the hard truth is that being a lawyer isn't for you. Sometimes the hard truth is that being an alim of the deen is not for you. And it's not that someone's trying to tell you, not that I'm trying to tell you that you can't accomplish it's that you have a fitrah, you have a nature that is better suited for something else. You guys understand? Look at the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Were they all identical in their abilities? Yes or no? Not at all. You have Hassan bin Thabit who was good at one thing. You had Salman al-Farsi who was good at one thing. You had Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu who was good at something. You had you know, uh, Khalid bin Walid who was good at one thing. Amr bin As who was good at something else, Saad bin Mu'ad who was a master in something else, each companion had something special. There was something that they were good at, something unique to them. And when they couldn't accomplish what the other had accomplished, it wasn't a matter of humiliation for them. It was acceptance. That there are some things that I'm good at, and that there are some things that are difficult for me. The things that are difficult for me, I can continue to try. It may take me maybe quadruple the time that someone else has accomplished it in. But my journey shouldn't constantly be compared with another person's journey. Because when you see people accomplishing what you failed to accomplish, it will without doubt lead to jealousy. The third thing that Allah Mawardi rahmatullahi mentions is not being able, not desiring, not liking to share the spotlight. You've been the center of attention, now someone else becomes the center of attention. You were the one who gave the khutbah in the masjid, and now the masjid finally hired a real imam. Now what happens? Your khutbas aren't as desirable anymore. You always give the halaqah to the sisters, and then now there is an alima, fadila, a sheikha, who has studied the she comes in the community, and now you're not, allowed, you're, not, you're, not, you're not invited for the events anymore. Jealousy is going to come into your heart. Because we have a tough time sharing that, that spotlight. And I've seen this within du'at, unfortunately. 
I've seen this within people. I know people online who say, you know, I've, you know, there was a particular institution that was doing some fundraising, and they wanted, uh, they asked me if I knew some people who they could ask to repost their Facebook post and get some attention online. So I named a few people, and I said, these are a few people that I know. They have a decent following. If you ask them to share your post, you'll get some, you you can get some outreach and cover some ground that way, exposure. So that brother, he then told me later on that I reached out to those people and they all said that they didn't feel comfortable sharing the spotlight with others. That the online following they had was based around their personal brand. These are language. This is the language used. These are people that I'm talking about who on their social media are talking about Quran and Hadith and they're saying that my efforts to build my social media following, it revolves around my personal, my brand. I don't feel comfortable sharing the advice of another shaykh with my social media followers. I don't feel comfortable sharing a fundraising cause for another institution if it's not my institution. How can a person avoid the harms of jealousy? Alama ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi, he lists certain things that a person can do to prevent themselves from the harms of jealousy. You notice that someone is jealous and someone is insincere when it comes to you. They're constantly trying to cut your legs off. You know that person who always contradicts you? Who's always just hateful, spiteful to you, they don't like you. You notice that there is jealousy coming from a particular direction. You can feel the dark side. So what do you do? So Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi, he lists out a few things. The first thing he says is, At-ta'awud billahi min sharri. That you seek protection in Allah from that person's evil. The second thing he says, At-taqwa. Focus on developing taqwa in yourself. Fulfill the commands of Allah. Stay away from what He has prohibited you. Because the one who is conscious of Allah, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Allah will make an exit for that person from every difficulty in their life. The third thing, الصَّبْرُ عَلَىٰ عَدُوِهِ To be patient with your enemies. Because there is nothing that annoys a jealous person more than the one that they are jealous of being patient. There is nothing that hearts them and kindles that fire even further. You shouldn't do it with that intention. You do it for your own benefit, just be patient. The fourth thing, التوكل على الله Know that as much as that person tries to harm you, they cannot harm you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one you rely on. وَمَن يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ Whoever relies on Allah, Allah will suffice them, Allah will take care of them. The fifth thing, فَرَاغُ الْقَلْبِ مِنَ الْإِشْتِغَالِ بِهِ That to empty the heart from being consumed with that person. When you find out someone's jealous of you, all your mind thinks of is that person. That person is trying to hurt me. That person is doing magic on me. That person is doing the ayn on me. This person wants me to fail. And because you're so obsessed with that person now, you are no longer able to excel in life. You've be, that person, you've allowed that person to become the barrier of your growth. So empty your mind from being obsessed with that person. Don't fear that person. Don't let your heart be full of thoughts of that person. And the scholars, they say, وَهَذَا مِنْ أَنْفَعِ الْأَدْوِيَةِ This is from the most uh, beneficial, most effective medicines that a person or, or cures that a person can use. The sixth thing is to remain sincere. Don't let that person change your motive. If you were doing some for, something for the sake of Allah, and now you see a jealous person that wants to compete with you, don't start competing back with them. Because then you will lose barakah in what you're doing. If you were doing something for a good cause, if you were being nice to your mother-in-law because that was in your nature, that's something your parents taught you to do, and now you have a sister-in-law who is angry and jealous that you're being too kind, and they try to chop your legs off, you just keep doing what you do. That's it. Maintain your sincerity. Do it for the sake of Allah. Number seven, to always make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reason why the scholars recommend tawbah is because they say every calamity in life, there's always a possibility it is a result of the sins that we've done. There's always a possibility there. So you should always start off by making tawbah to Allah. That Ya Allah, if the difficulty I'm facing is due to a sin that I committed, I ask you to forgive me. And be sincere. If you sincerely ask Allah for forgiveness, it is impossible your Lord will not forgive you. 
And then you are hopeful in the mercy of Allah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without any doubt, will take care of your affairs. The eighth thing the scholars they mention, and this is also one of the most effective things that you can do to deal with jealousy, to prevent and protect you and your family from jealousy, is to give sadaqah on a daily basis. Every day give a little sadaqah. And this will protect you. فَإِنَّ الْبَلَاءَ لَا يَتَخَطَّاهَا Calamities cannot surpass, cannot overcome this wall of sadaqah. Sadaqah becomes like a wall. Number nine. And Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi says, وَهُوَ مِنْ أَصْعَبِ الْأَسْبَابِ عَلَى النَّفْسِ And this is the most difficult thing, the most difficult cure on the nafs, on the inner self. And what is that? الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَيْهِ To be kind to that person. Because if you want to save yourself from the harm of that person, think long term. This person's jealousy is not going anywhere. What you can do is go on the offense and start being kind to them, win their heart, remove the misunderstanding, and come to common terms and help them defeat their jealousy. Every time he increases in his hatred and jealousy, you should increase in nasiha, love, and ihsan. And the eighth thing, um, Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi says, وَهُوَ تَجْرِيدُ التَّوْحِيد Never lose your sight from tawheed. Believe in La ilaha illallah. Believe in one Allah. And this is similar to tawakkul. But it's a little bit more broad in its, in its message. And what's that? Sometimes there are some people who are so paranoid by the jealousy of those that are jealous that they stop living life. They're terrified. They believe more in the power of the jealous person and their harm than they, than they believe in the power of Allah to protect. If that person has a desire to hurt you, they can't hurt you until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows that to happen. So your reliance should be on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this doesn't mean that you should be careless as well. That you should start flaunting yourself and you know, not be protective. You know, I'm not in favor of people posting their happy marriage pictures on social media or their you know, happy children pictures on social media. And the reason is because you know, there are people out there who are hurting. And not every jealous person <coughs> gives the evil eye because they're evil themselves. Sometimes people become jealous due to their personal circumstances. You know, they don't have to be ill-intended. Someone may have just broken out of a relationship, or maybe their child has passed away, and you post a child, you post a picture of your own child, and you're having a blast. Now, a mother who might see this, who might glance at this, it might cause hurt to her. You know, and there's precedent for this. If you're wondering. If there's any precedent for this, there is. The Prophet ﷺ forbade children from eating fruits publicly until they shared it with their neighbors. You understand? If a person has a fruit, he ﷺ told kids, you shouldn't eat it publicly unless you're willing to share your fruit with other kids. And if you're not willing to share it with them, then eat it at home in your private house where no one else needs to see you. Because if they see it, then their hearts are going to desire it too. That will increase them in pain because they don't have what you have. Why do you want to flaunt it in front of other people? right? I know that just literally flushes down the purpose of social media because that's all people use it for, to show off that you know, this is what I'm doing in life. Well, that's not all people use it for, to be honest with you. Many people like to share what they're doing in life because the people who are friends with them they consider them as friends and they want to keep them updated. That, you know, Alhamdulillah, my child just graduated. It's not necessarily a boasting or flaunting. Again, they're innocent too. There is a level of um, delicacy, you know, in the issue. And you have to be careful when walking this line. If someone can ask me what's necessary, what's absolutely necessary is for you not to be ill-intended and to want other people to feel the pain of not having what you have. You understand? That's not a good thing. You know, when the... Um, when this, uh, when, I mean, it's still ongoing, but some time back I read this article that while the bombing was going on in Syria, there were two groups within the Syrians. There are those who are pro-government and then there are those who are anti-government. Those who are pro-government and they're pro-bombing, they would flaunt and they would show off in the face of those who were being bombed by you know, posting pictures of them partying or posting pictures of them eating food or drinking clean water. Now that's a very messed up thing to do. 
Because you're ill-intended. And know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is qadir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives. Wallahu yaqbir wa yabsut. Allah is the one who gives and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who takes. Never get too proud of yourself. So don't be ill-intended, first thing. The second thing, in addition to that, always seek protection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from those who have intended enmity, enmity towards you. And there are a few things that you can read for protection. Uh, I'll suggest a few things. The first thing, make a habit of reading the last two surahs of the Qur'an every morning and evening. And surah ikhlas, the last three. Surah ikhlas, surah falaq, and surah nas. Make this a part of your daily reading. The second thing the scholars recommend is also reading Ayatul Kursi every morning and evening as protection. The next thing, in the morning, it's desirable for a person to read the following dua. Bismillahi ladhi la yadurru ma'a ismihi shay'un fil ardi wa la fis sama wa huwa samiul alim. In the name of Allah, with whose name nothing in the heavens or earth can ever harm. And he is all hearing, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing. And there are many other du'as like this that can also be read. The next thing mentioned in this hadith, the Prophet, after saying, La tahasadu, he said, Wala tanajashu. What is najash? The root of this word najash, it means in language, itharatu shay'i. بِالْمَكْرِ وَالْخِيلَةِ وَالْمُخَادَعَةِ To provoke something through deception, through makar, through, you know, uh, very sneaky planning, and mukhada'a through cheating other people. That's what najash means, to cheat people. Abu Atahiyah, he says, لَيْسَ دُنْيَا إِلَّا بِدِينٍ وَلَيْسَ الدِّينُ إِلَّا مَكَارِمُ الْأَخْلَاقِ the, This world has no value unless you accomplish religion, your religious values in this world. لَيْسَ دُنْيَا إِلَّا بِدِينٍ The thing that you need to accomplish from this dunya is your deen. وَلَيْسَ, الدن, وليس الدِّينُ إِلَّا مَكَارِمُ الْأَخْلَاقِ And you haven't accomplished the deen until first you've accomplished good character. Excellent character. إِنَّمَا الْمَكْرُ وَالْخَدِيعَةُ فِي النَّارِ هُمَا مِنَ الْخِصَالِ أَهْلِ النِّفَاقِ As for deception and treachery, they are both in the fire and are the characteristics of people of hypocrisy. What does najash mean? So I gave you the literal definition. It's to provoke someone through deception and treachery, cheating. What does it mean technically? The scholars, they say, najash is a type of transaction. They call it bay'un najash. Bay'un najash. Bay'un najash, what is it? أَنْ يَزِيدَ فِي السِّلْعَةِ مَنْ لَا يُرِيدُ شِرَاءَهَا إِمَّا لِنَفْعِ الْبَائِعُ لِزِيَادَةِ الثَّمَنِ لَهُ أَوْ بِإِذْرَارِ الْمُشْتَرِ بِتَكْثِيرِ الثَّمَنِ عَلَيْهِ Have you guys ever heard of false bidding? Yes, if you remember, if you remember, this was very common on on eBay back in the day. What was that? In auctions. In auctions, in auctions, people still do it. This is very common in auctions, but in eBay, people used to do this a lot back in the days. This happens basically in auctions. Bayo najish is something that happens in auctions. What this means is that there's one person who's selling a car, for example. We're going to run with an auction example. A person selling a car. Now he knows that the car is worth three thousand dollars. So he tells a person that you come to the auction and you bid 3,500. If you bid 3,500, someone might see you showing interest and you pushing the value of that car above market and they might try to beat you. And therefore, my car will go for $4,000. This is what you call bay'un najish. Where someone places a bid without having the intent to buy. They have no intention of buying. The only reason why they're doing it is to push the price of that higher. So on eBay, what would happen is that when the bid would be closing, let's say there were a few minutes left, a person would call five of his friends and say, hey, place a bid, place a bid, place a bid, place a bid. Five people would place bids very quickly, and now an innocent person, a naive person would come on and he would see that this product is growing in price, you know, uh, greatly, and has grown in the last five minutes. So what does he think? This must be a hot product. 
So then what does he do? He then outbids the other people and ultimately he takes a loss. This is called bay'un najash. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا تناجشو Don't do this with one another. Not only should you not have hasad, but don't cause financial harm to one another. Now najash is done for two reasons. إما لنفع البائر لزيادة الثمن له أو بإضرار المشتري بتكثير الثمن عليه Sometimes a person places the false, the false bid to benefit the seller. You understand? To benefit the seller. That I'm, gonna, the, I'm a friend of the seller. I'll place a false bid to raise the price just enough. I'll, I'll, I'll place a bid 3% in excess to what he's offering right now, knowing that someone will offer 5% in excess. And therefore he'll make 5% more than what he was already making. Or the other reason why some, someone might place a false bid is not because they want to benefit the ba'ya. Sorry, not because they want to benefit the ba'ya, yeah, the seller, but rather they want to harm the mushtari. I just don't like that guy. There's a guy that I look at and he just doesn't look good. His face looks bad to me. You know? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place a higher bid because I know he wants it and I'll make him fork out another $10,000 for the same product. Bi'idrar al-mushtari. Now there is a discussion, a difference of opinion amongst the scholars on what's the ruling of the products sold as a result of bay'un najash. Is the transaction itself sound or not? You guys understand? The transaction, someone placed a false bid to raise the price up, ultimately this person came, another person came, purchased the product. Now what's the ruling on the transaction? He finds out, let's say for example he finds out, he sees there's a guy in the back, you know, and they're both giving each other high fives and he hears them that these two were in on it together and they pushed me above market rate, they, they conned me. So what's the ruling of that transaction? So there's one group of scholars who say that إِنَّهُ fasid, That the transaction is void. It doesn't count. It's a wrong transaction. However, majority of the fuqaha, they say, actually sorry, there's a condition. They say the transaction is void if the person who placed the false bid was asked to do so by the seller. You understand? If the seller incentivized or asked a friend to place a false bid, then the transaction is fasid. But if that person placing, placing a false bid was not put into place by the seller, then it won't affect the transaction. That's one opinion. The second opinion, and this is the opinion of the majorities, um, the Hanafi ulama, the Malikis, the Shafi'is, and also one opinion of Imam Ahmad and Hanbal rahmatullahi alayhi, almost all the madhahib are on this position. They say that the anal bay'a sahihun, that the transaction will be okay. It'll be a wrong thing they did, they will carry a sin, there is karaha in that transaction, but all in all, that transaction will be complete. Because the arkan of a transaction were met, there was ridha. There was a person selling a product, another person was willing to purchase it, and the, there was a product on one side, and there was wealth on the other side. So all of the arkan, all the components required for a transaction were met. Even though one of the parties was being dubious, or they were cheating, they carried that sin, and they will be accountable with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is an opinion from Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi, and also a riwayah from Imam Ahmad al Hanbal. They say that the transaction will be okay, however the one who purchased, the one who got cheated, will have khiyar. Khiyar means he will have the option. If he wishes, he can maintain the transaction, or if he wishes, he can annul and break the transaction. Then Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi says, the one who purchased and he was cheated, if he was cheated, what she calls, وَغُبِنَ غَبَنًا فَاحِشًا that he was cheated in a very bad way, meaning this person was ripped off. The product was supposed to sell, the car was supposed to sell for 5,000. These guys, they did bay'un najash, they placed false bids and they took it to 50,000. So that's what you call a horrible rip-off, okay, as a result of this. So they said that if there was a, um, it was a bad rip-off to this person, then he will have the right to get a refund on the extra money and bring it down to market value. He will have the right to ask for a refund for the extra money and bring it back to market value. Now what is Ghaban Fahish? What does that mean that he's ripped off? Because that's very subjective. What does it mean to be ripped off? So then Imam Malik 
uh, and also وَقَدَّرَهُ مَالِكٌ وَبَعْضُ أَصْحَابِ أَحْمَدْ Some of the companions of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal rahmatullahi alayhi and Imam Malik, they say بِثُلُثِ الثَّمَنِ That anything over the one-third of the market value is considered a rip-off. So let's say for example, that car was, to, was supposed to sell for 6,000 and they made him buy it for 9,000. Now, is 9,000 more than one-third of the market value? Yes or no? Yes, it is. Right? One-third of the market value of 6,000 would be 2,000. So that would mean 8,000 is one-third more. So 9,000 is more than one-third of the market value. And because of that, he will have the right to, to, um, to ask a demand the return of that extra money and bring it down to market value before uh, allowing the transaction to continue. Okay. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in the hadith, he continues and he says, وَلَا تَبَاغَذُوا And do not have hatred for one another. Something to reflect over. Imagine a society where everyone was jealous, everyone was cheating, and everyone had hatred. What joy would there be in being alive? If everyone around you was jealous, everyone around you cheated you, and everyone around you hated you. And I'll be honest with you, Allah protect me for, Allah forgive me for saying what I'm about to say. Unfortunately, this is the reality of some of the Muslim countries in the world. I feel, I feel bad saying it. It hurts me. It really hurts me. That your brother who you stand side by side with in salah is the one who's jealous of you. Your brother who you do dua with is the one who's cheating you. He's the one who hates you the most. Go to the Muslim countries and look at the markets there and look how much they cheat. How much lying happens there. How much deception for a few dollars. And as a result of that, our countries will never move forward. When I say our countries, I mean the countries of our forefathers. Our country is America. This is where we are. You know? But those countries will never move forward now, unfortunately. Many of these countries. Our Shaykh would say that successful countries aren't always built on money. They're not just built by strong armies. They're built by honest citizens. They're built by upright people. You can say whatever you want about the government of this country, but for the greater part, the citizens are honest. People are honest. Yes, there are people who will cheat you. Don't get me wrong here. You know, those who will cheat you and who, have, who are ill-intended are everywhere. But put a ratio down and you'll find more honest people here. You go to the, you go to the government office and try to slide the person, you know, a hundred bucks, what will happen? You'll get arrested for trying to bribe a government official. You won't get away with it. You go to, you know, many of the countries that some of us have visited in our life, and if you have a problem with the government, what do you do, guys? Slide a hundred. You know? You get pulled over, you're getting a ticket, what do you do? Slide 100. You want to get into first class in the train, what do you do? Slide 100. That's all it is. It's just, depending on how many hundreds you have, what happens? You make it through life. These sort of societies can never thrive. The human being has to be built as an individual. لا تحاسدوا ولا تناجشوا ولا تباغذوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us as brothers. We are as mankind. We are as brothers. We have a bond of humanity. And if we hate one another, if all we can do is be angry at one another, if our hearts can't love one another, then what kind of brotherhood is that? A mother hates herself, carries shame on her shoulder because her children hate one another. What kind of society are we if we can't just love one another? There is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, where the Prophet ﷺ, he states the truth. I mean, those are, that's basically all the hadith, but this hadith in particular, it's so straightforward. I love it, I love it about this hadith. I love that thing about this hadith. It's just so straightforward. It's a simple equation. And it's a hadith that applies to every single human being. What is that? He said, ﷺ said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ لَا تَدْخُرُوا الْجَنَّةَ حَتَّى تُؤْمِنُوا by the one in whose hand my soul lies, you will not enter into paradise until you believe. And your belief will never be complete until you love one another. Should I not tell you of a thing that if you do it, you will start loving one another? They said, Oh Messenger of Allah, of course, tell us. What was the solution the Prophet ﷺ offered? Afshus salam Say salam to one another. 
If there's someone who you had an awkward conversation with in the masjid, at home, at work, do you really care for that conver conversation so much that you're allowing it to take you to the punishment of Allah, the anger of Allah? Does it really matter that much? Is that where your ego is now? Then you can't just go and say salam to another person? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us that this hatred and animosity, animosity between the hearts of people is the trick of shaitan. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ الشَّيْطَانِ أَنْ يُخْيَعَ بَيْنَكُمُ الْعَدَاوَةَ وَالْبَغْضَاءَ All shaitan wants to do is place enmity and hatred in your hearts for one another. Don't fall for that trap of shaitan. In one narration, as narrated by Imam, Abu, Imam Ahmad, Imam Abu Dawood, and Imam Tirmidhi from Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَلَا أُخْبِرُكُمْ بِأَفْضَلِ مِنْ دَرَجَةِ الصَّلَاةِ وَالصِّيَامِ وَالصَّدَقَةِ Should I not tell you of something that is greater than salah, greater than prayer, greater than siyam, greater than fasting, greater than sadaqah, greater than giving charity? قَالُوا بَلَا They said, of course, the Messenger of Allah tell us, إِسْلَاحُ ذَاتِ الْبَيْنِ the Prophet ﷺ said, mending bonds between people, joining relations, bringing hearts together. As for causing corruption and hatred between people, breaking the hearts of people, it is haliqa. What does haliqa mean? Like it will shave you, it will wipe away your good deeds, it will, it will rinse you clean, you will be destroyed, right? By causing corruption, hatred, Enmity between individuals, between people. The Prophet ﷺ in another hadith as narrated by Imam Ahmad al Hanbal from the narrations of Asma bint Yazid radiallahu anha. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ala unabbi'ukum bi shararikum? Should I not tell you of the worst people from you? Qalu bala ya Rasulullah. They said, Of course, a Messenger of Allah tell us who are the worst people. Qala al mashauna bin namima. Those who carry namima. Namima means tail bearing. That you take one person's story, you share it there, take another person's story, share it there with the intention of causing hatred between people. You know, what we also call stirring. Stirring between people. You know, Masha'una bin Namima. Al Mutafarriquna bain al Ahibba. And their ultimate goal is to break the hearts of those who love one another. And this hatred, you know, another trick of shaitan is that he causes us as good human beings to hate one another simply because of our differences. You have a political difference with someone, you start hating them. You follow another madhab from someone, you start hating them. Someone doesn't pray salah like you do, you start hating them. They don't fold their hands where you fold your hands or they want to raise their hands and make dua after salah, you start hating them. These are all issues of ikhtilaf. Legitimate differences of opinion. And should this be a reason of causing hatred? That's why Sheikh Muhammad Awama, Hafidahullah, he wrote in his book, Adab al Ikhtilaf, that there are two things Ikhtilaf and Khilaf. Ikhtilaf is a healthy difference of opinion, where you disagree on an issue academically, but you still love one another. And Khilaf is where your hearts are broken. He says the first is not only permitted, but it's recommended in the deen. We promote academic differences. But the second, where your hearts are torn apart, this is madmoom and disliked, it's makruh, that your heart should ever break because of an issue. If you were in front of the Prophet ﷺ, do you think he would ever allow you to hate another brother because you tie your hands in a different place than where he ties his hands? Do you think the Prophet of Allah would ever approve of that sort of iman? Do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would ever approve, that sort of, approve of that sort of iman? Absolutely not. However, the scholars have said that it is, permissible, or it is permissible and permitted to stay away from speaking to another person. Actually, I'll come to that uh, in a moment. Let's cover the next part of the hadith. The Prophet says, لا تناجشوا, لا تحسدوا, لا تناجشوا, لا تباغضوا, لا تدابروا. لا تدابروا means don't turn away from one another. Okay? What does it mean? Abu Ubaid, he says, At-tadabur al-musarama wal-hujran ma'khud min an yuwalli ar-rajudu sahibuhu sahibahu duburahu That a person turns his back on another person. He walks away. Two people aren't talking to one another anymore. And this is the result of tabaghadu. When two people hate one another, they will break apart. They won't talk to each other anymore. The Prophet ﷺ said that it is not permitted for a believer to not speak to his brother for more than three days. 
And the better of the two is the one who initiates with salam. The one who brings that wall down and says salam. There is one hadith that I always think of when I have a disagreement with someone. And it motivates me, it helps me to overcome that disagreement. Should I share that hadith with you? Beautiful narration. Zabardast. The Prophet wasallam said, I guarantee a person, a house in the middle of Jannah, who gives up an argument even though he's right. You understand? I guarantee a person, a house, it's fi wast. Wast can either mean middle or it can mean the highest as well. That awsat can also mean, was can also mean the highest and or, or it can mean the middle. Linguistically it holds both meanings. The Prophet of Allah is saying, I promise you a house in the middle of Jannah if you apologize. Even though it wasn't your fault, because what does everyone say? But it wasn't my fault. The Prophet of Allah is saying, I'm speaking to you. Go to that person, say salam to them, smile at them. Similarly, in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, as narrated by Imam Abu Dawood, "Man hajar akhahu sanatan fahuwa kasafki damihi." That the one who does not speak to his brother for a whole year, it's like flowing his blood, as if you've killed him. You know, what's the benefit? Why are you staking? Why are you? Why are you going to carry on with this? How long will you continue on with this? Now, however, the scholars have given permission for a person to discontinue speaking to another due to a religious reason. And the proof of this is the Prophet ﷺ not speaking to those three companions who stayed behind from the Battle of Tabuk. وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا As the Qur'an mentions them in Surah Tawbah. These were three people who the Prophet ﷺ himself stopped speaking to until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses regarding their forgiveness. So there are certain circumstances that have become permitted to discontinue um, speaking with one another. What is necessary to do in order to end this discommunication? You understand? This disconnect between two people. What do I need to do? This is a common question. I had a breakup with my friend and you're saying that I need to avoid not speaking to someone for more than three days. So I want to say salam to them, but is that all I have to do or do I need to do more? Sometimes someone will say that I've had an argument with my parent. Do I only have to say salam or do I have to do more? I had an argument with my uncle. Do I only have to say salam or do I have to do more? I'm going for hajj and I did someone wrong. Do I have to apologize or is saying salam to them enough? Are you guys understanding the scenario? So always remember the, Remember one thing I'm going to tell you guys. Okay. Going back to that Hajj example, that if you're ever considering, you know, that, that question comes up a lot, that I'm going for Hajj, do I have to send so-and-so person an apology? Do I really have to send so-and-so person, even that one person that you're avoiding, and you have a reason why you don't want to apologize to them? I always tell people that everyone else you're thinking of sending that template email to, don't send it to them. Because they're going to be confused. They're going to have no idea why you're asking for forgiveness. They're going to start doubting you. Maybe you took something of theirs. That's why you're asking for forgiveness. What you need to do is, you know that person you're avoiding, that person you're thinking 10 times of before you want to send that message to them, go to them and send them the message. And don't send them some, you know, some template email. Send them a personalized message addressing the issue to the best of your ability and trying to hash it out, talk it out. Then you'll say, but it's very hard to do. But so is the hajj that you're going to do. So is the reward that you're trying to accomplish from this hajj. You have to put extra effort into it. And burn down, you know, those walls. Break down those walls that you've put between yourself and other people. So what must be done in order to end hijran? The break or the, dis, dis, the miscommunication between two people. So the first group of people, they say, that saying salam will suffice. All you need to do is say, Assalamu alaikum. By saying assalamu alaikum, that's it, that's good to go. You're good to go. Another group of scholars, they say, Actually, they base that the first group of scholars who say salam is enough, they base it off a hadith that Imam Abu Dawood rahmatullahi alayhi narrates. لا يحل لمؤمن أن يهجر مؤمنا فوق ثلاث. It is not permitted to dis, to stop communicating with another believer for more than three days. فإن مرت به ثلاث فيلقه فيسلم عليه فإن رد عليه السلام فقد اشترك في الأجر وإن لم يرد عليه فقد باء بالإثم. That 
If you meet that person after three days, you say salam, and then that person says salam, you both share the reward. But if he doesn't say salam, he carry, if he doesn't reply to your salam, he carries the sin, and you are free. You will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for initiating, for taking that step. Some scholars, as attributed to Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi wa qad ruya an Malikin annahu qal, la tanqati'u al-hijratu bidun al-awdati ila al-mawadda. Which is a very difficult position to follow. Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi says, in order for you to overcome this break of communication, saying salam is not enough. You have to return the relationship back to loving one another like it was previously. Now you can imagine how hard this would be. In particular, if there's someone that you had an argument with, and it went so far that you didn't talk for three days. So it's, it's a very difficult thing. The best opinion on this issue is a more nuanced position. And it's the third opinion. And the third opinion, وَفَرَّقَ بَعْضُهُمْ بَيْنَ الْأَقَارِبِ وَالْأَجَانِبِ They've differentiated between your relatives and people who are not your relatives. فَقَالَ فِي الْأَجَانِبِ يَزُورُ الْهِجْرَةُ بَيْنَهُمْ بِمُجَرَدِ السَّلَامِ As for people who are you are not related to, saying salam to them is enough. بِخِلَافِ الْأَقَارِبِ As opposed to those that you are related to. You had an argument with your mother, saying salam to her is not enough. You have to return things back to how they were. You had an argument with your sister, saying salam is not enough. That's not enough. You have to work on that relationship until you can bring it back to where it was. That's why this third position, I like it a lot. It's more nuanced. Where you appreciate who the person is while, while working with the issue. In the next part of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ prohibits uh, us from placing an offer on another person's transaction. This is another narration from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. Where the Prophet ﷺ says, Do not place an offer on another person's transaction. What does this mean? Does this mean we can't go to auctions? Because in auctions, what's happening? People are placing offers on other people's offers. Is this hadith saying that we can't go to auctions? No, not, that's not what this hadith is saying. What this hadith is saying is that there are two people who've met. They've agreed upon a product and a price. They've shaken hands on it. The only thing left is changing hands. This person says, my money's at home, or it's still in my bank, I'll transfer it tomorrow on the weekday. And this person says, I'll mail it to you in two days. So they've agreed, they've shaken hands, the only thing left is for the actual transaction to occur. For the money to go and the product to come. Now, in the interim, in the meanwhile, someone else finds out that that house was on the market, and this guy's agreed to sell it for 300000 and that's a steal, and the market value is 350, I'll pay 340. So you're badly beating that person's price while keeping yourself still in benefit because it's 340. And you come to this person and you try to lure them, you try to sway them. That give me the give me the give me the give me the property. Forget that person. This is what the hadith is saying. Once two people have agreed, don't come in the middle. You understand? In Urdu we call this kabab mihadi. Right? That you become a thorn in something that shouldn't have a thorn, you know? I don't know how to pronounce that kebab behind in English. I can't think of a good translation. I mean, I can think of it literally, a bone in meat, but that doesn't really mean much, right? You know when you're eating kebab, do you expect a bone in there? You're eating and everything's going good, you're like, oh, there's a bone here, what's this doing here? So the transaction was smooth, everything was working out, and all of a sudden there's this third guy who came from nowhere, and he jumps in and is claiming the transaction. Now, the other example, وَلَا يَخْتُبْ عَلَىٰ خِطْبَةِ أَخِي What does that mean? That um, a person has made a proposal and the boy and girl and their families have agreed on the proposal. They've gone into an engagement phase. You know, people say engagement is nothing in Islam. That's not true. There is something as engagement. There's no such thing as engagement parties in Islam. That's true. But engagement is actually something that's established where two people make a commitment that we will get married to one another. They mutually agree as individuals that we will get married. So two people are engaged, if you may say. Now, in the meantime, there's a guy who comes in, he sees the girl and he says, SubhanAllah, the mother of my children is right there. He starts asking around, someone tells him that there's a guy, he just proposed to her and their families have agreed. So then he comes to the father at the masjid, he says, how are you doing? You're doing well? 
Alhamdulillah, you know, it's hard to come for Isha Salah, but I, I, I get out of my, uh, my rotations and I come directly here. The father thinks, well, this guy's a doctor. There was a friend of mine, he used to, this is a true story, a true story, a true story. He would wear scrubs to the masjid every day. I asked him, why do you wear scrubs when you go to the masjid? He said, it makes me more desirable in the community. When I get married, I'll find the right person. So that he starts fishing until he puts the hook in the right place and he hooks the father. He then meets the girl and says, do you want to eat dal chawal for the rest of your life or would you like biryani? That's the dal chawal, I'm the biryani. Now what he does is he uses his charm, his personality, his education, or whatever else it is that people use. And he lures her out of the engagement. This is what the Prophet ﷺ is saying don't do. And as absurd as this may sound, unfortunately this happens a lot. It happens quite frequently. And the other person who gets cheated out of what they've agreed on, it hurts them. You know? Because they had a commitment, they had something that was theirs, and someone else comes and steals it. The Prophet ﷺ said, don't do it. However, in the narration of Sahih Muslim, as narrated by Uqba bin Amr, the Prophet ﷺ said, وَلَا يَخْتُبْ عَلَىٰ خِتْبَةِ أَخِيهِ حَتَّى يَذَرَ He puts that condition. حَتَّى يَذَرَ حَتَّى يَذَرَ means, unless, until he pulls out. Now that person says, I'm no longer interested in this girl. Now, someone else can come and make a proposal. Or that person says, I'm no longer interested in the home. I'm going to move to California instead. Someone else can come and place an offer. Now one thing I want to mention while we're at it, just as we said, in the transaction that multiple people can place an offer at once, multiple girls can, place, can make a proposal to one man. Or multiple men can make proposals to one woman. Are you guys following? When, it's not permitted when two people have gone into agreement. That's what's not permitted. So you can reach out to the Shadi auntie, uh, the Rishta auntie, and ask her to send you 10 bio datas. Right? It's a basic thing. You go to the Rishta auntie, there's one auntie who knows all, everyone that's getting married, and everyone forwards their, their brief bio to that auntie, and she carries all of them. She's like, the, she's like the vault. She is, you know, matrimonial. She is the matrimonial website. She's the OG matrimonial website. And everyone starts sending her their bios, and if anyone's interested, you reach out to them, and she sends, top, she sends 10 at once, like passing out candies. Or like, you know, you know, Pokemon cards, here's ten, here you go, go play with them. And then you go through ten of them, until so you find the right person. I don't know if that's ever going to help you find the right person. But anyway, khair. There's a little fiqh associated with this mas'ala, but I'll leave it for now. We'll, we'll move on. The Prophet ﷺ then said, be brothers of one another. Be brothers. You know, learn to love one another. In one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, تَحَادَوْ That give gifts to one another. فَإِنَّ الْحَدِيَّةَ تُذْهِبُ وَحَرَ الصَّدْرِ That give gifts to one another, for indeed gifts removes wahar. Wahar means heat. It removes the heat in the heart, meaning enmity and hatred that's in your heart, it'll remove it by giving a gift to another person. In one narration, he said, تَحَادَوْ تَحَابُ That give gifts to one another and your love will increase. In one narration, as narrated by Umar bin Abdul Aziz, he narrates it marfu'an to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Tasafahu fa innahu yudhibu shahnaa wa tahadu. That when you greet one another, shake hands. It'll remove that animosity you have in your heart. Hassan al Basri said, al musahaf al musafahatu tazidu fil wud. That indeed shaking hands increases in love. Your love will increase for the person that you shake hands with. Mujahid, the famous Mufassir, he says, بَلْغَنِي أَنَّهُ إِذَا تَرَاءَ الْمُتَحَابَّانِ فَضَحِكَ أَحَدُهُمَا إِلَى الْآخَرِ وَتَصَافَحَ تَحَاتَّتْ خَطَايَاهُمَا كَمَا تَحَاتَّتْ الْوَرَقُ مِنَ الشَّجَرِ That when two people see one another, and they smile at one another, and they shake hands, and they greet one another, their sins fall off just like leaves fall off from a tree. The Prophet is telling us to be brothers. And the responsibility of brotherhood is that you desire good for your brother and you save your brother from evil. And then this explains the next part of the hadith. Now the Prophet ﷺ says in the next part of the hadith, you will not oppress your brother. You will not fail him. You won't abandon him. You won't lie to him and you won't belittle your brother. Because you are a brother. You never oppress another person. We already talked about oppression. I won't go into that. 
You won't fail him. Khidlan he uses. What does fail him mean? Khidlan huwa tarukun nusrati wal i'ana. It is to not help someone in their time of need. The first one is don't do zulm. The second is don't abandon him. What's the difference between zulm and khidlan? They say zulm is for you to initiate the oppression. Khidlan is for you to leave him when someone else is oppressing him. You have the ability to help but you walk away. That's called abandoning your brother. Someone is struggling in their marriage, you just walk away rather than trying to help them. You've just abandoned your brother. Someone is struggling financially, you can help them, you walk away. You just abandon your brother. The ulama, they say that for a person who has honor and wealth, the zakat of that honor is that you help people who don't have it. People who are struggling. People who don't have that position that you do. If you can write a recommendation letter and get them that job, then help them. Don't abandon people. You know, the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, مَنْ أُذِلَّ عِنْدَهُ مُؤْمِنٌ Whoever is present and they see his brother, a believer, being disgraced, فَلَمْ يَنْصُرْهُ And he does not help him. وَهُوَ يَقْتِرُ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَنْصُرَهُ And he is able of helping him. أَذَلَّهُ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ رُؤُوسِ الْخَلَائِقِ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ Allah will disgrace him in front of the creation on the Day of Judgment. Because you could help someone and you didn't help. Similarly, a narration narrated by Imam Bazar rahmatullahi alayhi from Imran bin Hussain radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ نَصَرَ أَخَاهُ بِالْغَيْبِ وَهُوَ يَسْتَطِيعُ نَصْرَهُ نَصَرَهُ اللَّهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ Whoever helps his brother, and he is able to help him, he has the ability and he does help his brother, Allah will help him in the dunya, and Allah will also help him in the hereafter. In the next part of the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu said, don't lie to your brother. In one narration, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, كَبُرَتْ خِيَانَةً أَن تُحَدِّثَ أَخَاكَ هُوَ لَكَ بِهِ مُصَدِّقُ وَأَنْتَ لَهُ بِهِ كَاذِبٌ How great of a treachery is it that you say something to a brother, you say something to someone, he thinks you're speaking the truth, but you're lying to him. You've just, you've just cheated this person. Never lie to another person. And then Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, وَلَا تَحْقِرُهُ And don't look down upon others, don't belittle others. This hadith is so beautiful. Because it's a long hadith, we've covered so much. But this is beautiful balagha, beautiful eloquence. And the ulama, they say, وَهَذَا عُودٌ عَلَىٰ بَدْ That right now, the Prophet ﷺ just took the hadith back right to the beginning. He started off by saying, don't be jealous. And as we close off the hadith, he brings it to the point where he says, and don't belittle another person. Bringing it back right where it started. هذا من أساليب من أساليب القرآن الكريم والسنة النبوية. فإذا طال المقام يعاد للتذكير بما تقدم. That when a discussion becomes long, at the end of the discussion you always connect it back to the beginning. That's when you know the person that's speaking knows how to speak. They know how to deliver a lecture. They always take you back to the purpose. The conclusion will always be in line with the the introduction. There'll be a synthesis between the two. Not just you know just divulging here and there, and at the end you're in a whole different place from where you started. And he gives an example of this. In the Qur'an, in Surah Baqarah, Allah, Surah Baqarah is the biggest surah, longest surah, correct? Allah starts off with, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ and finishes the surah off with, آمَنَ Rasul. So it starts with iman, and also at the end of the whole surah, it ends with what? Hundreds of verses later, it ends with iman too, to remind you. That's where your focus needs to be. This is what the actual message was. So the hadith started off with hasad, and it brings us back right there. That don't belittle another, uh, another believer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an regarding belittling others, don't joke and mock on other people. Because sometimes you may think you're better, but they are better than you. لا يسخر قوم من قوم عساء يكون خيرا منهم ولا نساء من نساء عساء يكون خيرا منهن That you may mock someone and think that they're nothing, but they may be better than you. And a group of women may mock another, uh, another lady or a group, another group of women, and they may be better than you. Someone might say, black people are criminals. How do you know they're criminals? Have you met every black person in the world? You know, white people are racist. Have you met all the white people in the world that you're saying white people are racist? You know, so all, all Indians are IT people. Not that that's an insult. <laughs> we'll take the 100K salary any day. But um, you, have you met all of them and you ask them what's your profession? That's an insult. Why are you generalizing? Generalizing is never a good thing. It's a bad thing. And unfortunately, in our communities, this is very common. Shaitan has plagued our hearts with ujub and kibr. Self, obsession, and pride. 
And we have created false ways to identify ourselves being better than others. We don't carry substance to make us better than others. Because if you want to be better than another person, as this hadith is going to tell us next, it's through taqwa. And we don't have taqwa. So we make ourselves better than others by saying, I'm from so-and-so race. That's why I'm better. I'm from so-and-so country. And it's so petty and silly. You know? I want you to think of a country right now. Can everyone think of a country? Choose any country in the world. In that country, one region of that country looks down upon another region. Is that true or false? Whatever country you're thinking of. Then if you go to one of those two regions, one city looks down upon the other city. True or false? Choose one of those two cities. One part, one village looks down, looks down upon another village. True or false? You go to the same village now, one part of the village looks down upon the other part of the village. True or false? It's true. Then within that part of the village, one family looks down upon the other family. This is all shaitani. This is all satanic. This is, these are whispers of shaitan. How can a person's value be determined on the color of their skin or the language they speak? This is silly. This is not meaningful. This is absolute nonsense. And unfortunately in our communities, each and every heart you know, is plagued. There's always that one group of people that people look down upon. There was one person, I gave a khutbah, and he came to me and he said to me after the khutbah, Sheikh, I agree with you, all Muslims are equal, I just have a tough time accepting, and then he mentioned a country. And then I said to him, were you even listening to my khutbah? Did you miss the khutbah that you think it's okay for you to come and just, you know, and then I'm sitting with people and throwing racial slurs around, you know, as if nothing's happening. Until we don't fix our act, we can't teach the world about unity. Malcolm X, rahimahullah, he said very eloquently that America is plagued with the disease of class, of separation, racism. And I found the solution to this within Islam. And it's true, Islam is the solution to racism. Everyone is one. No race, class, no nothing, no gender difference, everything, everyone is equal. However, we can only talk about it if we act upon it ourselves. If we don't act upon it, how are we going to tell the world that we have the solution to racism? Because at that point, our words are empty and they're not necessarily meaningful. The Prophet ﷺ then says, he encourages us of taqwa, he points towards his heart and says, taqwa is here, and this is where you need to focus. So taqwa will help you accomplish everything that was mentioned above. You will stay away from jealousy through taqwa. You will not cheat one another through taqwa. You won't turn away from one another through taqwa. You won't be angry with one another through taqwa. You won't oppress each other through taqwa. You won't look down upon another person through taqwa. You won't abandon your other brother through taqwa. You won't lie to one another if you have taqwa. Now the Prophet ﷺ, look at the eloquence of the hadith. He closes off by giving the solution. At-taqwa ha-huna. Focus on building consciousness with Allah. If you have a bond with Allah, you won't desire to harm other people. You won't want to harm anyone. You'll always want to be there to help others. And Imam Nawi rahmatullahi alayhi further proves this point through the next hadith, which we'll cover next week, inshallah. So focus on it. Reflect. The Prophet ﷺ was asked, Man akramun nas, who is the most honorable of people? He وسلم, said, Atqahum lillahi azza wa jal. The one who is most conscious of Allah. That's the person who is most honorable. There's a hadith in Sahih al Bukhari that the Prophet ﷺ was sitting, and there were two other companions sitting there. While they were sitting, one person passed by. So one friend said to the other friend, مَا رَأْيُكَ فِي هَذَا What's your opinion regarding this person? So فَقَالَ رَجُلٌ مِنْ أَشْرَافِ nas. He said, this person is like, he is from the cream of the society. He's a respectable person. هَذَا وَاللَّهِ حَرِيٌّ إِنْ خَطَبَ أَنْ يُنْكَحْ وَإِنْ شَفَى أَنْ يُشَفَى That he is, if he ever presents a proposal to anyone, they will accept it. And if he ever intercedes on behalf of someone, that intercession will be accepted. The Prophet ﷺ heard this. He didn't say anything. فَسَكَتَ النَّبِي He remained silent. صلى الله عليه وسلم. ثُمَّ مَرَّ رَجُلٌ آخر. Then another person passed by. So his buddy asked him, you know, actually the Prophet ﷺ said this time. Now the Prophet jumped in. The Prophet said to them, what do you think about this guy? They both looked at him. قَالَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ He said, the Messenger of Allah, هَذَا رَجُلٌ مِّنْ فُقَرَاءِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ He is from the lower class of society. He is from the poor people, from the Muslims. هَذَا حَرِيٌّ إِنْ خَطَبَ أَلَّا يُنْكَحَ He is worthy that if he makes a proposal, no one will accept it. 
And if he intercedes on behalf of someone, his intercession will not be accepted. The Prophet ﷺ, in response to this, he said, هَذَا خَيْرٌ مِنْ مِلْءِ الْأَرْضِ مِثْلَ هَذَا That the second man is better than an earth full of people of the first man. Because the second man had taqwa. And that's what really determines your value. Not the way you dress, not which neighborhood you live in, not which school your kids go to, not which car you drive, what kind of suit you wear. These things don't matter. What matters is the heart that you have. Muhammad bin Ka'b al-Quradi, while doing tafsir of the opening of ayat of Surah Waqi'ah, إِذَا وَقَعَتِ الْوَاقِعَةَ لَيْسَ لِوَقَعَتِهَا كَاذِبَةً Then Allah describes the Day of Judgment as خَافِذَةٌ رَافِعَةٌ خَافِذَةٌ رَافِعَةٌ means it will bring down some and it will raise some. So he commentated by saying, تَخْفِذُ رِجَالًا كَانُوا فِي الدُّنْيَا مُرْتَفِعِينَ وَتَرْفَعُ رِجَالًا كَانُوا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَخْفُوذِينَ that it will raise some, meaning those people who had no honor and no respect on the road, but they had taqwa, Allah will raise them on the Day of Judgment. And khafida, it will bring some people down, those people who thought they were everything, they were, you know, they thought they were arrogant and they thought they had the whole world's attention, on the Day of Judgment they will have no one's attention. They will be washed away. The Prophet ﷺ pointed towards his chest. And that's to remind us that the true value of a person is in their iman. How, did it, how they develop themselves internally. It's not here, it's not in your face, it's not in your bank account. That's not the true value of a person. It's what kind of individual you are in your heart. And the ulama also write, the Prophet ﷺ pointed towards his heart when he said taqwa is here to indicate that no one can ever see inside your heart so no one will ever know whether you are conscious or not and you'll never know if other people have taqwa or not so never belittle another person. Because whether they're conscious of Allah, whether they have taqwa or not, you'll never know. Only Allah knows and they know. That's their secret with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The true essence of taqwa is a sirrun makhfi. It is a hidden secret. No one can ever really know of their taqwa. Allah knows and the person involved knows. So don't, don't belittle other people. You don't have the right to mock other people. The Prophet ﷺ closes off the hadith by saying that the blood, wealth, and honor of a brother are prohibited without his consent. You can't hurt someone, kill someone, you know, spill his blood, or steal his wealth, or harm his honor. You can't do that. Because his honor is protected. His, his wealth is protected. His blood is protected. Every individual is protected. So you have to be like that for them. Al-Mu'minun, the Prophet ﷺ said, believers are not there to hurt one another, they're there for supporting one another. Establishing brotherhood. Our deen, if you study, you'll, you'll see that this hadith really manifests itself in Islamic law. Because in Islamic law, there are five maqasid, that are known as the maqasid al-shari'a. These are the ultimate goals that the sharia, Islamic law, is trying to accomplish. What are the five goals that Islamic law is trying to accomplish? Hifd al-deen, protecting the religion, giving every person the freedom to practice their religion. Hifd al-nafs, the protection of life. No person should be harmed, killed, robbed. I mean, no harm, killed, or bullied, or pushed, or hit, unrightfully. Islam, if someone is trying to hurt another person's body in any way, Islam will step in right away. Sharia will say, you do not have the right to hurt another innocent person. Hifd al-aql, to protect the human intellect. Hifd al-mal, protect human wealth. If there's any cheating or that happens in the stock market or in the trading area, in the markets in general, Islam will step in and say, this is halal, this is haram. There's no cheating. One of the goals of the Islamic law is to protect the human wealth. And hifd al to protect lineage to make sure that the family structure is safe, children are looked after, parents are looked after, spouses are looked after, brothers and sisters are looked after, the family structure is preserved. I'd like to finish today's khatara, today's discussion, today's hadith class, with one reflection. And I want you to think about this deep in heart. And I want this to be on your mind tonight. That if we as societies and communities, Muslim and non-Muslim, were able to implement this particular hadith, what kind of world do you think we'd live in? What do you think the world would look like? If the Muslim countries, the Western world, third world countries, first world countries, everywhere in the world, if people were just to implement this one hadith that we discussed today, I want you to think of what the world would look like. Then I want you to think, and understand that where we are today 
in terms of the stunt in our growth as a society, as a community, may be the result of not practicing these important teachings of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purifies our hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthens us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables us to be brothers of one another, to be sisters for one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthens us as a community and purifies our hearts and instills our hearts with contentment and love. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.